Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Metadata. Software. Metadata. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 244 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in Ann Arbor. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Thanks to Text Expander for sponsoring our show. Communicate smarter with Text Expander. Gather, perfect, and share your knowledge. Recall your best words instantly and repeatedly. Learn more at TextExpander.com forward slash podcast. And we'd also like to thank ServeNow, a nationwide network of trusted pre-screened process servers. Work with the most professional process servers who have experience with high volume serves, embrace technology, and understand the litigation process. Visit ServeNow.com to learn more. In our last episode, we discussed the much-talked-about arrival of the 5G cellular platform and why we are taking a wait-and-see approach. In this episode, we decided that some recent survey results and developments in cybersecurity have made us decide that the wait-and-see approach that we have for 5G no longer makes sense in our cyber-dangerous world. What can you do where seemingly no one else cares about security. Uh, Tom, what's on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, we will indeed be discussing cybersecurity, or as you like to put it, cyber insecurity. In our second segment, we'll talk about whether it's time for mandatory CLE training on this very subject of cybersecurity. And as usual, we'll finish up with our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second that this podcast is over. Uh, but first up, cybersecurity, or as the title of this uh, podcast ought to be named, Cyber Insecurity. You know, Jack Dorsey, who is the CEO of Twitter, um, when he has his Twitter account hacked, and we're going to talk about how in just a little bit, it makes us both wonder whether it's safe uh, out there for anybody these days. Um, we both sort of checked and looked to see about cyber insecurity and collaboration tools. We, we did a show last year about cybersecurity and using collaboration tools. We gave a presentation on the same topic, uh, the College of Law Practice Management's annual meeting, and... Uh, you know, I think to our mutual surprise, the problems have not yet gone away or gotten better. So we thought we'd revis revisit the issue again, uh, see if anything has changed or if anything has gotten remotely better. Dennis, what was it? Was there something that made you want to revisit this topic? Yeah, I, I think incredibly this situation is actually getting worse. And so my motivator uh, for the, to revisit this topic, which I, I realized I was going, uh, I look back at my blog uh, a couple times over the years. And I, in the early years, I used to write about cybersecurity a, a lot. And then I just gave up because I didn't think anybody, it was just sort of like I felt I wrote this stuff and threw it off the cliff that nobody paid attention to it. But so every year I've been doing a tech report, it's called, that's a summary of the the survey results from the ABA's annual technology survey. And so uh, I covered the area of, of cloud computing. And so one of the things I've been watching is that in this survey, there's a there are a couple questions on cybersecurity and the security precautions that, that lawyers are taking with their cloud computing tools. And for the last three or four years, I've been just saying that they're pathetic and that it's a real area for improvement. And then incredibly, in, in the current results, and I don't think my report has been published yet, but that it's, a, it's significantly worse. So they list about 12 very, very basic uh, security techniques that you would you would use. And the the most commonly used one, which is to use the, uh, the secure protocols or the HTTP PS protocol that we're all used to seeing in the browser with the little lock is the most commonly used, which is around 40%. And then there are, there are common techniques like looking at privacy policies and other things that you know, went from the mid 30% uh, to 25% 
uh, use, which to me is incredible because last year we had the EU uh, data privacy issue that was front and center. We've had all these issues about state uh, hacking of computer systems, and the approach the lawyers are taking to it is even more cavalier than before. So that's that's sort of the thing that prompted it. But time uh, it's just one of many things. There's like a ton of cybersecurity issues out there, and a lot of them just show just incredibly sloppy practices out there. Well, so what's interesting about that survey result where the, the number one is that 40% of people use the secure website to, to access certain websites. Um, what sort of blows me away about that is I, I'm pretty sure that Google Chrome visits those sites on default. They go to the secure site. So I don't think users are actually doing anything consciously to go to those sites, which is even sadder, even the, that they say that they're doing it and 40% or say that they're doing it. They're not doing it intentionally they're doing it just because their browser happens to take it there because their browser is paying more attention to security than they happen to be you know i think that that cloud portion of the of the tech survey it definitely shows the lack of precautions lawyers are taking with regard to cloud tools, but um, I, it doesn't really give any more overall stats on so what I would consider the general security precautions, passwords, multi-factor authentication. We're going to talk a lot more about those. You know, every year I see articles, two or three articles come out, why you need a password manager and everybody goes here, here. And yet no one's using a password manager. I would say that when it comes to the cloud tools that you talk about, um, I I almost make the assumption that and, and maybe maybe I'm wrong here but uh, cuz I don't know the demographics of the people who took the survey but I sort of tend to assume that lawyers in larger firms have IT departments when it comes to cloud tools anyway have IT departments that are providing sufficient security around those cloud tools um, and that you know maybe it's not something the lawyers are doing. I'm, and, I, and I tend to think that the insecurity around use of cloud tools is more towards solo and small firm lawyers who are their own IT departments, who, who are probably showing that they don't take a lot of precautions because they really don't know a lot about it. And I think, if I recall correctly, solos and small firms actually take the lead on adoption of cloud tools because it makes the most sense for them in their practice. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say au contraire. I mean, because I, I think that uh, these security techniques, a lot of them are things that any lawyer should be able to do, like review privacy policies, to to look at the the confidentiality provisions of contracts, to to even look at the the agreements that they're entering into, and so it's a lot of the things are things that should be are due diligence about the companies themselves. They're, they're things that lawyers should be able to do, and that to me is is what's shocking and then also you compare that percentage with people saying here's my concern about cloud computing is i'm i'm worried about the security or here's why i don't do cloud computing because i'm worried about the security i'm like look if you make zero effort at protecting your data and your client's data and learning how this stuff works, yeah, you have reason to be concerned, but I'm guessing that probably what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis on security is probably even more shocking. Here's kind of a, a true story about a small firm and it's kind of shocking too, um, small firm, you know, less than 10, you know, less than 12 people who work there between professionals and and staff and um, using Office 365. So great. They're kind of ahead of the curve, moving using a tool they should use. And uh, turns out that the person who's responsible for finance and for payroll and stuff like that has probably one of the weaker password choices. And it's a it's a it's a commonly apparently a commonly known name in this person's family, um, either a, a family member or a pet. And uh, it's not, it, you know, it's probably eight digits and uh, somebody comes in and they go to her Office 365 account and they do a brute force attack. So they, they run a computer program against it. it. It takes a couple of hundred times to run that before they break it. And frankly, a couple hundred times is means that the password is pretty weak. They break that password. They go into her online Outlook account and they begin to send emails out as her. And they're able to successfully convince 
the payroll company to redirect two of the payroll checks to a different bank. Uh, so they st- steal two payroll checks. They go to three clients and try to convince the clients that the firm has uh, changed banks. And one of the clients actually sends a check for quite a lot of money to this other bank before finding out that it was all a fake. No two-factor authentication set up there. There were two opportunities to stop that hacker dead in its tracks. The first would be to set a strong password that would be much more difficult or much more daunting to break. Even if the password could have been broken, two-factor authentication um, would have, I think, stopped it dead in its tracks or maybe as we've seen recently, um, if it's done right, it's 99% effective. Yeah, so I, I and and I would say the other piece, and this is like a little. I, I understand the reservations on this, but on the brute force attacks, if you limit the number of attempts, that also um, that's true. Before there's a complete fail, you know, but a lot of people get nervous about that, right? So if you you, you if you only have like four or five attempts and you don't realize you have your caps lock on and you're you know typing your password in. You know. oh, but even if you do 10, I mean, 10 is not unreasonable. Right. Um, it doesn't have to be unlimited. If it, I think even 10 or 20 is not bad, but uh, yep, you're absolutely right. So I think that, and, and that's what's surprising to me. So you could say, I always figured like each year I've been on the internet, I've learned like some new sec- security technique that I've adopted. Usually um, I learned that from you and your recommendations, but, but I sort of go out there and like try to learn this stuff. So yeah, so we saw this, uh, uh, the statistic recently that if you go to multi-factor authentication, we did a show about this, but it's basically where you have a password and something else that indicates that you are you. So either you have, uh, you know, a phone or a dongle or a fingerprint and something like that, plus password, that that gives you essentially a 99% confidence in, in, in that you're going to be secure. Or if, if somebody tries to, to hack, you're going to get some notification that you're able to, to know something's going on and to have the chance to, un, you know, uh, I don't know what the right word is. I would say unconfirm it while it, while it's happening. Now, there are some nuances of multi-factor, which, as I say, you try to learn as you go along. So there's there's definitely some people advise against using uh, SMS or text messages uh, when you're doing multi-factor. So it's good to read the literature and, and understand what those concerns are. But I, there's just some standard things out there that um, I run into all the time with with lawyers. So where you might be concerned or read things about like these zero day attacks where somebody figures out this way to uh, where there's a at least a theoretical uh, security breach and somebody can can uh, take advantage of a flaw um, before a patch can be done. There's a lot of concern around that. But basically, I would say this is a huge percentage of the intrusions in the successful compromises come from unupdated software, uh, software that aren't patches applied. I mean, there are people out there using Windows 97 and other programs, or, or I'm sorry, Windows 7 and other programs that are, are out of life. They're just not being supported anymore. And so the it is, it's trivial for, for somebody who wants to get, get into those because the the, the routes in or uh, known, and there, you may even have a toolkit that can use them. So it's, it's kind of like, there's a lot of things, Tom, and we've, we've talked about this from time to time, which is why I want to revisit this. It's, it's like, there are some basic things that you can do that can put you um, really, you know, a lot safer in, in the world of security that people just don't do. And it's hard to understand the reason that people don't do that. Well, no, I agree. And come back real quick on your multi-factor authentication. Um, I am one of those people who believes it is not appropriate to rely on SMS, uh, on text messaging for multi-factor authentication. Sometimes you can't avoid it. Um, Some vendors, some companies only do it that way. I try to limit it as much as possible. I I still say, and I, I don't know how many shows we've done where I mentioned this, use an authentication app. You know, Authy is a great app. Um, Google has an app. I'm using Microsoft now on my Office 365 account, my own personal one. Um, and I think they're all great tools. And I think that enabling multi-factor authentication on any 
account that you have that could impact your money. So banking, financial accounts, but then also the email and the tools that you could get into to get to those financial accounts. So if I'm banking using my Gmail account, I'm going to protect my Gmail account as well. Um, and so it's kind of, we'll talk a little bit later about how to how to solve for those things, but think carefully about who, how you need to protect the different vectors of approach to get into your firm or just even to into you personally. Now, when it comes to the fact that so many people are running unupdated programs, I agree with that. I think that there's, I think when you come to the practice of law, you have a lot of people and I'm not clear how often this happens, but I just remember lots of lawyers probably telling me that, you know, I've had this desktop for 10 years and I'm happy to keep using it and I'm still using WordPerfect and everything works great for me and I'm going to use all this stuff until I, until it dies on me and I need to get something new. And that's really not how technology works, especially around security. But I will say that part of the problem also is there continue to be brand new ways that bad people can get to us. And keeping up with it all, I think, is pretty overwhelming. And it's not our necessarily our day job to do. And so, you know, take, for example... I think we've talked about this on the podcast, but um, but the one that kind of scares me the most right now is SIM swapping. I mean, that's how the CEO of Twitter essentially had his account hacked. Is it someone got a hold of a phone and put his SIM, got got him uh, got his SIM card swapped over into that one? And so here's how it works: a person will walk into a phone store and give them your phone number and give them apparently enough information to convince the phone company that they are you and say, I lost my SIM card. Can you give me a new one? And you'll be sitting there using your phone and all of a sudden it'll die because it's no longer your phone anymore. It belongs to the other person. They turned it on at a, at a, at a AT&T or Verizon store and you have no idea to get back to it. And getting back to your phone, getting that back from the person who took it from you is extremely hard to do. So my, my word to the wise there is I, I went, when I learned about how this could happen, I went to, to my uh, carrier and I've placed a verbal password on my account. So if anybody tries to do anything they first must answer that verbal password, uh, which only I know and nobody's getting to. And hopefully that will be enough to protect me. Um, the other quick thing I want to mention is if you've been reading the news lately, you will have noticed that I think 22 cities in the state of Texas, 22 municipalities were struck with ransomware. And the way that they got to all 22 of these was through the managed services IT provider for all these municipalities. So that was the weak link. The weak link was an IT services company who deployed stuff out to these municipalities and as part of that deployed ransomware. So, uh, you know, um, understanding how these things happen and how to protect yourself against them them is a huge issue. It's even bigger than it's ever been. And I think um, we'll probably, Dennis, uh, talk a little bit more uh, in our B segment about how you propose to address this issue. But I, I think that's one of the biggest problems we have is just keeping up to date on all the new issues um, and possible ways that somebody can get into our stuff. So I agree with that, but I also say that we're just doing a terrible job on the old issues, you know, so poor passwords all over the place, the the incredible thing of uh, poor passwords and default passwords on administrator accounts, uh, leaving default settings on hardware devices. Um, I, you know, I think there's not doing multi-factor on admin accounts is, is pretty amazing to me that people will take those chances. And then, then I think there's a couple, and I, you I consider you now the expert on, on one of these things, but there's a couple things that I, I think are opening the doors in other ways too. So a lot of places give you these security questions that you can choose from to recover your accounts. And so it's like, you know, where were you born? What's your mother's maiden name? Those sorts of things. And those are pretty easy for people to find or to guess. And then you add those things to the social media quizzes where people are like, here's 15 questions I'm answering. And it's sort of like, you know, what street did I first live on? You're like, what was the first job I had? That sort of thing. You're going like, oh my God, you're just putting the answers to these questions right out into the open. So you have to pay attention to those things as well. And then, then Tom, I think that leads right 
to uh, what you've ex you experienced, uh, you know, with the social engineering, which has become so effective that it's just almost like the telephone tax where people come in and say they're you. And, you know, you just kind of walk through this thing and, you know, either guess what the passwords are or have somebody bending over backwards trying to help you recover your account or recover a password. And I think that social engineering probably has been for a long time and still is the most effective way of breaking into your system. And you just, you look at what people do as a matter of course, and it's shocking. Well, and I think you're right. I think social engineering is a way that, you know, technology can't protect against to a certain extent. And uh, I mean, that's what happened to me back in June was that someone called my bank and through telephone calls were able to take money out of my account um, and still haven't found out exactly how they did it. I still haven't found out exactly what information about me they had. Um, I think it's probably pretty clear that they had some part of my social security number, at least enough of it to get through. And I, I believe that I was a victim of a, a, you know, I was part of the Office of Personnel Management hack a long time ago, and they had my social security number because I did work at one point in time for the government. So, Easy to understand how they might have that. When it comes to those security questions, I totally agree. I think that, you know, I, I, a while back, my mother's maiden name is quite common. I mean, excuse me, quite unusual. Um, but it's something that would be easy to find out what the maiden name was. I used to use it all the time because I thought, well, who would know such a weird name? Well, you know, my social media, my cousin puts that name up on her social media page all the time because that was my grandmother's mate or my grandmother's married name. So what I have started to do for security questions is I'm giving completely fake answers to the security questions and I am putting the answers because I'll never remember them. I mean, that's part of what makes the security questions great is you remember what your mother's maiden name is or what your first dog was or your, what job you've always wanted to do. That's easy to remember, but um, I've been putting things that are so ridiculously wrong, I put them into my password manager for that account so that if I ever have to do it, I've got the answers to that. And I hate that we've come to that place, but I know for a fact that no one's ever getting through any of my security questions again, because there's no way they will come up with these answers. I mean, unless somehow they're able to break into my password manager and that would really be the end of the world as I know it. I do have a, a, a way that somebody might be able to do that, but I'm not going to share it on the podcast. I'll tell you after after the show, though. Uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so let's let's get to what people can can do, Tom, because I, I think that you know, first of all, our concern comes in collaboration tools because it really is the case that your really poor security uh, practices can have an impact on me. Um, when we're using collaboration tools. Flat out problem, growing problem, you can call it an exponential uh, problem in terms of security, but it, you know, it's everybody has to, to think about what's going on. I always say, you know, you gotta protect the herd, you know, so like your, your bad practices have an impact on me, so we need to think about everybody. And then the second thing that's worth uh, noting is the millions of new devices being connected to the internet. So the internet of things, sensors, all these other things. There's a great story a couple of years ago, somebody got into a casino's network through an internet connected aquarium. So, uh, and it's important to really understand how the security stuff works because you go like, oh my God, I'm never going to have an aquarium and I'm, why, I don't want to have something connected to the internet. Well, it's the mere, the mere fact it's connected to the internet is not the problem. It's basically when they went in and found something that had an easily breakable password or a default password and were able to, to get in that way. So it has nothing to do with the aquarium. The real issue is, is going to be the password password and the fact that somebody could get to it. So here's my thinking on cybersecurity, Tom, is that I think that they're, they're really, you just really have to learn as a citizen of the internet, um, some basic security. And I, you know, you're not going to get to 100%, but every little bit you can do is helpful. And I'm going to spend one half of one of my classes in my at, at Michigan State uh, this fall, it's actually next week, I'm just going to do cybersecurity basics, because I think it's so important for lawyers. And then I think with the ransomware, that just illustrates that backup 
is part of security. And so it's likely that uh, there's going to be a problem. And what you want to be able to do, especially with ransomware, is to have, have a backup that you can pull back and, and just just go go on. The third piece, and you may want to comment on this more, I love, and we talked about it, this Microsoft Secure S Score, which goes through and gives you some things you can do uh, with point values so you can pick the sort of high value uh, practices that you can add that will really improve your security and you know show what progress you're making on security. So I don't know, Tom, do you have some other things and you want to wrap us up? Not really. I mean, I think that in addition to what you said, I, I like to think about what are the points of entry to get to you um, or to get to your firm? Um, email, financial accounts, phone. Think of all the services that people can use to get to you. You know, for example, you know, I may give my debit card number to Fandango to make buying movie tickets a little bit easier, but I'm less worried about security there because if they get hacked, I can always just turn off that credit card. Um, I'm less worried about them getting access to that because they have limited information that I'm nevertheless protected against. Um, so I think focus on the places that are the most likely targets and need the most protection. Learn the basics, passwords, multi-factor authentication. Don't click that link. I, I know that, uh, that some of you may be receiving what they call calendar spam lately. I've had uh, spam calendar entry showing up on my Google calendar lately telling me about a free iPhone. Don't click that link. Uh, the only reason you're getting these spams is because somebody's clicking on that link to get to it. Um, I think that backup is a no-brainer, but I also think that backup is something that goes on behind the scenes and you shouldn't have to worry about it. So it's not about backing up regularly. It's put a system in place and let it go. Make, make sure that it's running. I agree the Microsoft Secure Store uh, score, although I'll tell you, you know, that, that Secure Score is something that an <laughs> that an IT director is going to have trouble fulfilling entirely. So I go into mine and I am woefully low on my secure score. Um, but there's a lot of stuff in there that I can't and just don't need to do for the pur purpose of, that it's a personal uh, account for me. But I definitely think that it is an eye opener to see how many different vectors of attack somebody can have into your account just by getting through your Office 365 account. So you know I think that all those things make sense, but I. I totally agree with the idea. Start with the basics. You know, there are a lot of new things and a lot of new threats coming up, but I I keep coming back to if you just follow the basics, you're going to protect yourself against a whole lot of those things. And it, it sort of goes back to the old joke, Tom, you know, about the bear chasing you and me. I, I don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be faster than you. It's sort of like if my security is, is better than you and you're an easier victim, then you're going to be the one who's more likely to be caught than I am unless somebody's specifically targeted you so keep that in mind so we're gonna have to figure out after the podcast which of us is <laughs> faster from there all right let's take a break for a message from our sponsors before we move on to our next segment looking for a process server you can trust ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screen process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry. Connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screen process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. Text Expander is a productivity multiplier. Lawyers love Text Expander because with a short abbreviation or search while typing, Text Expander can produce cover emails for invoices or signing instructions, insert templates for consistent meeting notes, perform accurate date math on the fly, and instantly present things you retype all the time. Text Expander runs on Macs, iPhones, iPads, and Windows and works in any application. Visit TextExpander.com slash podcast for 20% off your first year. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. In this segment, we want to talk about cybersecurity 
as it relates to the ethical rules on technology competence. So uh, for the lawyers out there, there's a new comment eight to model rule 1.1 that addresses technology competence, and it's been adopted in 36 states since 2012. So I guess that's fast in terms of the legal profession. And its key part, it says a lawyer should keep abreast of changes in the law and its practice, and this is the key part, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology, and then engage in continuing study, education, et cetera, uh, to keep to keep uh, abreast of the changes in law and technology. So I believe this rule means anything. It means lawyers have to keep up on cybersecurity. Then I also say, if you look at the rules about our uh, lawyers' obligations of confidentiality to clients, I think that also require an understanding and use of good cybersecurity practices. So we're not seeing that happen out there. Um, and we we see Florida, states like Florida, North Carolina have taken approaches that require mandatory technology CLE, but I'm not sure that's enough. So, Tom, I, my question for you really is, have we reached the, the crisis point where it's time to require mandatory training on cybersecurity itself with some real teeth, uh, such as testing and certification for lawyers, or maybe even more than that? Okay, so... I think we're going to agree on a lot here. I think making cybersecurity training mandatory is a no-brainer, even if it's just for awareness purposes. I think requiring attorneys to take, let's just say, two hours per year of cybersecurity training is not too burdensome that it would create an issue. But I do think that you're going to start to get resistance if you require more training than that or if you require some level of certification by the lawyer. I, I, the natural resistance of lawyers to change, I think, will kick in. The things and things are going to bog down. Not that that's a good thing. Not that change isn't a good thing. Not that having people push back. We've had lots of things that lawyers have pushed back against that they don't need more. Email is one example. Um, but I think it's going to be the same thing that happens whenever someone tries to get lawyers to make a radical change to how they operate. They push back. Sometimes they push back hard. Sometimes there's lawsuits. There's ethics commissions that deal with things. But I think so. Here's the here's the other part that I think is going to be a challenge. The cert developing a certification process would really require the creation of a whole new layer of infrastructure in the legal market that, that doesn't exist at least in its in the format it needs to exist in to get to the goal that you want. It would open, I think, lots of new opportunities for certain kind of companies, but I don't know that it would have to be created, maybe not from scratch, but you'd be creating a new standard for cybersecurity for, for law firms. You could just use the same security. You could leverage probably the security standards for other industries, but you'd have to come up with something for the legal industry. Um, I think, frankly, the real push here is going to come from clients who are demanding greater levels of security for the data their lawyers are keeping for them. You know, in fact, my company right now, we're working on cybersecurity standards that would allow law firms and vendors to become accredited so that the clients would feel more comfortable with information that, that they're storing with them. But I think, though, that this push, if it comes, is really only going to be led by the big clients who know better. And if you're a solo or small firm lawyer and you have individual clients, they won't know to demand this sort of thing. They won't know to say, you need to protect my information. So I hate to say that it's not just the lawyers that need the education, it's the consumers and the clients that need it too. But I think that while this is a great idea, I don't see this happening without a lot of issues down the road. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it really does come down to looking, and, and we're supposed to look at the client's perspective, right? And so the fact that it's inconvenient for lawyers and they don't want to learn it, to me, has to be balanced out it, with you compromising my confidential information. So I think that's where the rubber hits the road. So I think you can go, uh, so I sort of, we're going to come out pretty close to this. I, I think that Realistically, it'd be nice to see some states take the lead on saying it's not just some, you know, some technology CLE, but there's there is going to be an hour or two of cybersecurity that's required annually in the same way that states require ethics. And it could be done as part of ethics, frankly, uh, because it, to me, it is a core part of that. 
I think that to say there's going to be certification, we, you know, lawyers live in a world committees. You and I know that five or six, if we decide there's going to be a certification, we five or six years from now and people will still be, you know, deciding how, how to word this certification certificate that you get. So that I don't think is, is super promising. I do think that there can be a push from the amount of practice insurance carriers that will, that will move some of these things forward. I think that regulations uh, and especially your regulated clients will help move things forward. And I think there's an opportunity, and this is why I talk to my students about is I think there's an opportunity that if you're a new lawyer or uh, you know a law student and you can pick up any kind of security certification while you're in law school or shortly thereafter, you could use that potentially for a competitive advantage. So I, I think it's going to be, you know, the carrot and stick thing. But I think that I think we're past the time. I, I this, you know, the data is out there and it's, it's shocking. So I think we're past the time where uh, we can say, oh, uh, security is too hard for lawyers to learn. They don't want to make changes. I think it's it's time to really uh, uh, put some mandatory training on people and and uh, this is coming from somebody who always prefers to learn things on my own because I'm I'm motivated to do that. But I, I look at a profession that doesn't in this area doesn't seem to be motivated that way. So now it's time for our parting shots at one tip website or observation. You can use the second this podcast ends. Time to take it away. So I am going to continue the theme, and my parting shot is a new website that I found that is uh, cybersecurity related, and it is called Your Things Scorecard. Um, it's at yourthings.info, and it's an initiative that provides smart home device man owners with insights about the functionality and security of their devices, and they measure on things like the device itself, the mobile application that comes with the device, um, the cloud endpoints, the internet services uh, that the device communicates with, and then network communication, the network traffic between each component of the smart device. Um, and they assign grades to each one of them. And if you want to be truly horrified about how insecure in general your Echo is or your Google Assistant or some other things in there, um, go look at this website, yourthings.info. It's, it's, I think, a very revealing look at how they grade security and how we still have a long way to go on the Internet of Things and cybersecurity. Yeah, so so mine is uh, also part of the theme where I, you know, where I said I think that backup is just a core part of security. So as, as they say, it's not if but when something happens. And so the other day I was thinking and I was looking at it and I say, you know, I have backups in four different places that that are happening, and I thought, you know. I, I'm a little concerned about a physical backup uh, to a hard drive and that because I, I do that. And I said, I, it seems like the technology is better now. It takes a long time to do that. I, on a Mac, you, you can do this time machine backup, which is, is really straightforward. And so I read about the, something called the RAV, R-A-V, power, all one word, uh, it's a 500 gigabyte mini uh, SSD drive. Uh, so it's a USB external. It's like a big thumb drive. It's like way bigger than your thumb, but 500 gigs on it. And for me, it was like, and it's $89. And it was like, well, here's, this is what I think I'm looking for rather than like an old, you know, external kind of slowish hard drive. I'll just add this SSD to my backup routine as, as another place and it will go faster um, and be easier to do as, as part of that routine and give me some comfort because it's an SSD. And it, so far, it's been great. I will say that, you know, like the first backup does take a long time, but, uh, you know, after that, the incrementals are great. And so it, it, if you're at doing that layer of backup where you have some physical uh, and local ones and some online stuff, I think this is a really interesting tool as is it's essentially the the, you know, that now the USB drive has gotten so big that it, you could do a whole backup. So I think there are some one terabyte ones out there that are more like the 200 range, but sort of for your personal backup, it's kind of an interesting way to go just to make it a little faster and easier. And you also have a device that's a little easier to hide in your house uh, if you're concerned about that. 
And so that wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You can find show notes for this episode at tcamreport.com. And I want to say you can... We've got to, I, will, I guess I should point out that uh, we have at least one person who's checking on the show notes who did point out that we've been very, very far behind on updating our show notes page. And we take the note. I'm going to start updating it uh, very soon. In the meantime, if you want to take a look, LegalTalkNetwork.com has got transcripts of all of our podcasts, which have the links or at least mention of the things that we talk about. So until we can get those show notes updated, please go to LegalTalkNetwork.com and check out the transcript. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or on the Legal Talk Network site, where you can find archives of all of our previous podcasts, uh, like I mentioned, with those transcripts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please reach out to us on LinkedIn or leave us a voicemail. We love to get voicemails. The number there is 720-441-6820. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy, and you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the Kennedy Mile Report on the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network.